Welcome to the current state of free static analysis. My name is Jason Turner. If you are interested, you can go to my GitHub project and check out the, this presentation, anything else. I am the co-host of CVPCast, which is a podcast for C++ developers. If you haven't heard of it, I suggest you check it out and listen. And I am the co-author of ChaiScript, which we'll be having an open session on tomorrow morning. Um, Feel free to join us. It's a, an embedded scripting language for C++. And I am the author of C++ Best Practices, which is a little website that is a uh, forkable coding standards document for your um, organization if you're interested. And I'm an independent contractor, not working for anyone in particular at the moment. So according to Wikipedia, static analysis is defined as the analysis of computer software that is performed without actually executing programs. Today, we're gonna to be focusing on source code analysis. There are tools that do object code analysis. And we're gonna be focusing on tools that are freely available, and specifically bringing up issues that I've seen in the wild and addressing whether or not static analysis tools that are out there can find them. Also, if you consider that static analysis is the analysis of programs without executing them, that includes compiler warnings. And some modern compiler warnings are extremely um, sophisticated. For example, with GCC, if you pass the incorrect parameter to a printf um, format string, uh, you get a warning without even enabling any warning levels, just using the default warning levels on GCC. So we're only gonna mention compiler warnings if they are unique. Tools that we're going to be talking about, CVP Check, which is an open source static analyzer that's free, um, Clang's analysis tools, Visual Studio's analyzer, which is built into the Visual Studio compiler, Coverty Scan, which really uh, doesn't quite fall into the category of the other three, but it is free if you have an open source project. And we're going to make some mention of Metrics Plus Plus, which generates uh, metrics about your code and copy and paste detectors. We're only going to be scratching the surface this morning. We've only got 30 minutes, and there are many, many tools and many, many checks out there. So we're only going to talk maybe about 10 different test cases of the potentially 650 that we could catch with the tools that we're discussing. That doesn't even count Coverty's uh, set of checks. So. This is an interactive session. What is wrong with this code? Yes? Side effects and assert. Side effects and assert, exactly. Um, right, so in a release build, the do something is gonna be removed, and depending on your compiler, you might get a warning in a release build telling you that I is initialized but never used, but that's the only clue that you have that something's gone wrong. Um, but if we actually use I, then we no longer get a warning. Interestingly, of the tools that I tested, none of them complained about this code, even though Clang and CPU check both explicitly say that they are supposed to catch assert statements that have side effects. So I don't know if it was just too simple of an example and it got it underneath their radar. What do we see here? You can yell out answers, whatever. It's always returning true. The if block is completely pointless. This is related to real code that I've found in my system after a couple refactorings. It's simplified, but it happens. And what about this one? Same basic idea. The nested if block is, uh, is returning the same value. So, but it's still a slightly different issue when it comes to static analysis. <clears throat> Excuse me. So CVP check caught the, uh, the first case, and I'm, I'm rather confused by the fact that CoverD did not catch the second case because the entire reason I have this example is because CoverD caught this particular test case in ChaiScript. Uh, so I, I still need to... Um, I still need to actually clean up this code in TypeScript because I wasn't positive maybe my second call to bare equal actually had some side effect or something. I need to analyze that. 
All right. Next example. Anyone? Oh, no, that's an L, sorry. It's just a, uh, <laughs> maybe a poor font. Yes, that's, that's true, and that's something we'll get back to in a minute, actually. So what size is unsigned on most platforms? 32-bit, right. And what size is size T being returned from a vector size? on 64. So we are only iterating over the first 4 billion objects. And similarly, uh, we are comparing long here. So we fixed the issue. Now we're 64-bit. But it's assigned long. So we're only iterating over potentially approximately 2 to the 63 elements instead of 2 to the 64 elements. And let's keep compounding the issue. Now we've got both of the problems here. It's 32-bit signed integer that we're comparing against a 64-bit unsigned. We've limited ourselves now to approximately 2 billion objects. So you already answered this question. What else do we have odd here? The vector is empty, which is interesting to point out. Anything else that's wrong with this code that someone might suggest modifying? Go ahead. Well, that's true, but the compiler can probably optimize out the call to size many times, maybe. But in a more general sense, how might we make this code better? Ranged for loop, exactly. So, Clang and Visual Studio warn about science comparisons. No one is warning that we're comparing a 32-bit to a 64-bit integer. And as a bonus, CPP check actually does a deep enough analysis of the code to tell us that we're iterating over an empty vector, which I thought was really interesting. And if anyone has used Clang Modernize, you'll know that Clang's uh, Modernize analysis steps can actually identify that that should have been a range-based for loop, and the whole problem would have gone away. Why does this matter? Has anyone seen this article by any chance? It's from uh, Google's research people. They um, published this blog posting in 2006, so nine years ago now. It's extra, extra read all about it. Nearly all binary search algorithms are broken. So this particular snippet of C++ basically uh, doesn't give you any warnings on most compilers unless on Clang you turn it all the way up to a dash W everything or in static analysis tools. But it is making all kinds of mistakes. We are truncating values all over the place. We are only iterating over at most the first 4 billion objects. And this starts to matter in real code today with large data sets. All right, this one, the title might give it away, but what do we have here? Throw at the end is never hit. It's unreachable. Visual Studio warns about that in the IDE, which I thought was pretty cute. Uh, nothing else does. Clang, again, you have to turn it up to W everything. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and as a bonus, Coverty, I'll flip back to that. Uh, tells us that, oh, by the way, in your main function, you're calling this function called go that has a really good chance of throwing an exception and you're not doing anything about it. Part of me says we're not Java programmers. We don't feel like we need to catch every single exception that comes, but it's, it's handy. All right, some gimmies. Obviously, dereferencing on all pointer and assigning to it. Uh, what about this one? Same exact issue, maybe slightly less obvious. But if we're just doing a cursory read of the code, though, we, we would read it as humans. 
What about here? Same thing, default constructing a shared pointer. Um, and I don't know if the, the C++ guidelines that were just published this week would actually directly address this or not because it's a default constructed shared pointer so it has a null value so none of the tools warn about it because you don't have to initialize something that's got a constructor and, but here we are assigning it to a, uh, a null value. So every tool caught the obvious case of directly assigning to a null pointer. Only CPP check could catch the indirect null reference and no tools caught the small, smart pointer version. What do we got here? Right, by the end, beyond the end of the range. We all got that. And what about here? It's exactly the same thing, but now we're doing it smart in C++11 instead. So C style arrays caught by all the tools, std array, actually I was kind of impressed, um, CVP check caught it, and Visual Studio notices the C style uh, array is being used uninitialized, which is handy. All right. Now we're getting into something a little bit more complex, perhaps. I'll wait for someone to answer this one. Right, so at the time that F is called on the very last line there, that some value that was captured by reference no longer exists. Okay, no, we're longer catching it by reference. What else, what we might be doing wrong here? Yes, uninitialized value. And let's compound it. Let's capture an uninitialized value by reference. It's interesting to see where the static analysis falls down. Um, everyone likes to complain about this code where we are using some value uninitialized. But if you throw the capture by reference in on this slide, so we're capturing an uninitialized value by reference, we've now confused every single tool that exists. You capture it by reference, they won't tell you that it's uninitialized anymore. And Visual Studio caught nothing. And I, I've talked to other people at the conference today, This capture something on the stack by reference accidentally and return it is a real problem. But as far as I know, no tool can catch it yet. This is another one of my favorites because this seriously broke some of my real code. Use after move, is that what you said? Yes. So we are passing the object O to uh, this function take that takes our value reference, we're moving it in, and take isn't actually taking it, but that's not really the point. Um, I would think this is something that something could catch. And real code that I had that was doing this, it operated fine with absolutely no problems, no crashes on anything on every platform except for my Clang build. So GCC on Linux was just fine. Clang on Linux, which I was moving a string or something out, uh, I would get a crash. And it took me uh, quite a while to figure out what I was doing wrong. <laughs> Go ahead. It's, that's true. In this case, and it, it, yes, std move doesn't actually do anything. As I think Scott Myers put it, move doesn't move, or something like that. All it is is doing is casting it to an R value reference, and the R value reference is then being passed into take. Yes. Um, but I would say it's almost guaranteed that if you wrote code like this, 
It's not what you meant to do. Fair enough. I was just making sure I wasn't missing some obvious or more more obvious. Right, go ahead. So a move doesn't invalidate the object when you move it? The move does not. If technically in this code, uh, for this for the object actually be invalidated, all right, so, so move cast to an R value reference, and then the R value reference is being passed into the function take. It would be up to this function take to like um, literally like uh, do a move construction or something and actually take the value out. I'm not expecting any of the tools that I was looking at to do enough program flow analysis to actually determine that it was actually being invalidated. I'm just looking for a tool to say, hey, dummy, you're using an object immediately after moving it. That's probably not what you meant to do. Yes? Okay, so, so the, for the sake of the video, the assertion is that um, a shared pointer is in a known valid state after it's been moved from. Is that correct? A unique pointer, sorry. That is correct? Okay, I'm getting other nods. I thought most of the standard libraries said that the state was unknown after an object had been moved from, like string and that kind of thing, but I... There's, like, there's special language for unique pointer. There's special language for unique pointer, okay. I accept that and did not know it. What's that? What caused the actual crash? What caused the actual crash? Um, in, uh, what caused the actual crash in my code? This, so this is a, obviously a simplified example. I would have to go back to my more complete example to remember, I'm sorry. I want to think I was I believe I was moving the values out of a vector and then trying to work on the vector after that. Oh, right, so as a bonus, CVP check, I'll flip back, points out to us that, oh, by the way, do something could be a static member because it's not actually touching any object data. I, that's kind of handy. Um, it, it calls it an, uh, an optimization um, announcement or something like that, like poor performance kind of code thing. I guess the compiler maybe can better optimize uh, static members. I, I don't know enough about compiler optimization. All right, let's see who was paying attention in Herb's talk yesterday. I am using iterators from three different vectors and insert. Coverty catches it. No one else does. And again. Right, P is dangling after I reassign S by making the new shared pointer. And no one, no one cares. So this is definitely some things where, where I'm hoping we'll get much better analysis with the discussions from the last couple of days with the C++ uh, guidelines. All right, now to talk about some of my honorable mention tools. Uh, Metrics++ plus plus can give you far uh, more metrics about your code than you could ever possibly need to know, but it can actually be very interesting. It can tell you things like, do you have any blocks of code that have really deep nested if blocks and too many tabs in a level and whatever? So this is an actual real snippet of code from ChaiScript where I'm doing a runtime check of the arithmetic type that has been passed in when I'm getting ready to do some arithmetic operations. And metrics plus plus in its cyclomatic complexity analysis tells me this is a really complicated block of code. Maybe you should consider refactoring it. And this is this was a simple example that was easy to uh, to put on one screen here. Similarly, the uh, copy paste detectors. This is from the PMD project, which does a bunch of um, uh, it, it does 
code, static code analysis on a bunch of languages. None of them are C++, but it has a sub-project called the copy-paste detector. And it can do analysis of your code and tell you where you've, well, done copy and paste programming. So it found this for me, which is my um, character escape sequence parsing in TypeScript that exists verbatim in two different parts of the library, and I still need to clean that one up. It just hasn't gotten a high enough priority yet. So downside of using static analysis. This code generates a warning on two different tools. It's one of my favorites to pick on. Um, can anyone make a guess as to what it might be warning at here? Yes, uh, yes, it is. Well, it is warning specifically on the first line of the add values um, declaration, variadic template declaration. Yes, very good. It warns that value isn't used because in this specific example, we're calling add values with one argument. So the variadic template add values, it takes one argument of value followed by zero or more arguments. In the zeroth case, the parameter expansion on the return statement, which is doing the um, initializer uh, for the standard vector, is not actually ever being called. It's being expanded zero times and so the compiler warning set, oh, by the way, value is not used. I find this terribly annoying, personally, because it is used. I just happen to be exercising it in the zeroth case in this place. So if you have a template metaprogramming stuff throughout your library and you have this, then you will get warnings from Visual Studio specifically, which I know the Visual Studio team is aware of this particular issue. And I just realized that if you turn the warnings all the way up, I think on Clang, then you can convince it to warn also. All right, so I guess I need to start wrapping this up. False sense of security, I would say, is a downside to using these static analysis tools. ChaiScript passed all of these static analyzers, um, and all warning levels on all compilers, practically speaking, with no warnings at all. I'm like, yes, clearly my code is perfect. And then I learned about the sanitizers provided by Clang and other tools, and I found a bunch more bugs. And then I learned about fuzzy testing while I was in, uh, doing an interview for CBVCast, and let that run, I think uh, I let it run for nearly three weeks on ChaiScript, and I found something like 15 more crashes in my code, and some of them were scary, like potential like security flaws in the code. So yes, use the static analyzers, but don't assume just because you're passing them all that your code is perfect. So as a quick real world example, in this code, the, uh, one of the static analyzers told me, this is, you know, it's snipped out, but the static analyzer was telling me that Red value was, red val was being assigned a value that was never being used um, without being reassigned later. So did a little cleanup, and now the flow of that makes more sense. I'm not having to assign the Boolean multiple times, whatever. And in conclusion, it was my, it's been my conclusion looking at these, and if you look at the list of specific issues that static analyzers catch, C style issues basically come across like a solved problem. They have been, linters and static analyzers have been looking for C issues for a very, very long time. But there are still many ways that we can abuse our best practices. And specifically, in C++ 11 related issues, we've got a long way to go. And something that I like to mention always is you need to be in a situation where you can use as many compilers and analyzers as you can to make sure your code is as good as you can. Cross-platform code, whatever it takes. 
uh, hopefully the C++ core guidelines will end up steering us in a direction where we can catch even more of these issues. So for my personal recommendations, whatever compiler you're on, if you don't have the ability to integrate static analyzers specifically into your tools, make sure you've got your warning level set as high as you can. Consider uh, enabling warnings as errors for your compiler. So with Clang, warn everything. You're going to have to disable some things because it. You can put Clang in C++11 mode and then turn on W everything and it'll warn you that you have code that is not compatible with C++98. Yes. So you're going to have to disable a couple things. And yes, so I would strongly suggest in your automated build environment turning on Visual Studio's analyzer if you're using Visual Studio. And we've all got other issues that we've seen. Consider writing your own analysis using libclang. There's a few examples out there of people using the Python bindings to libclang for doing code analysis. It looks like it's pretty straightforward to do. There's one particular check, um, CNCC, I believe is the name of the tool. It's written in Python, and it'll analyze your code to make sure that you're following your own internal naming conventions, for instance. Like, now that these things are available to us, let's start using them. And also, all the examples on here, plus a bunch more, I threw into a repository called that I called my analysis test suite. It's, at this point, basically a repository of how to not write C++ code while still letting the compiler give you no warnings. So contribute if you have got any, uh, got any ideas there. And again, this is who I am. Come check out the open session tomorrow morning on TriScript. And I'm an independent contractor, always looking to meet new clients if anyone's interested in talking to me. Thanks. Any questions? <laughs> yes? I work on a large code base, and the issues that I have with static analysis tools are that they produce a lot of false positives. Some of the uh, commercial tools have a capability where I can go in and mark them as false positives, so I don't keep getting those errors that are quickly. Yes. Is there CVP check will, so the question was whether or not in a code with, um, with lots of false positives if you can disable them. CVP check specifically if you find that you have one particular false positive that's throughout the code base, you can disable that particular warning at the top level. Or you can also enable a flag that lets you selectively disable analysis warnings around particular blocks of code. I've personally found in my own code that stuff that I thought was false positives, it ended up often not really being a false positive. So at this point, I have only, um, but I mean, my, my code base isn't gigantic, but I've got maybe six places throughout the whole code base where I'm selectively disabling warnings from different compilers and different analyzers. Anything else? Yes? C I guess I'm, I'm thinking of the question from here. We use Coverity, but it takes days from a... Yeah, Coverity, even on my toy examples using the free Coverity scan, it takes like 30 minutes before I get a response back from Coverity scan. I don't know if that's simply because they just have the open source stuff on a slow server or what. I've never used the, the commercial tool. But CPP check will only, well, excuse me, CPP check will let you patch the number of jobs to it that you want to run so that you can actually run it in parallel across your code base. And even on very large code bases, it's slower than, it's faster than our build. So if you can run it in parallel with a check-in um, with your build, then you should be good. And Clang's, uh, excuse me, Visual Studio Static Analyzer, I believe is much faster in Visual Studio 2015. So that should be something that we can start seriously um, impl implementing in our continuous build environments. And I'm out of time now. Thank you.